All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a um, good holiday with your family. Um, we certainly did. Here uh, with uh, Paul and Josh and Glendlin Thames. Glendlin's with uh, Economic Community Development, and economic help is on the way for small businesses and individuals. So she'll be prepared to talk through that in just a minute. Let me just give you the last four days of uh, COVID-related information. Uh, I can jump to the chase here. Um, the positivity rate is stable at about 6%. This is now uh, a couple of days post-Christmas, um, and, and that's a good sign. Um, we're watching it like a hawk. New York flared up. Rhode Island flared up. So um, we're not an island unto ourselves, but so far, so good on that front. Uh, hospitalizations, uh, 19. Remember, that's over four days, so that's pretty stable. We feel um, good about that so far. 113 fatalities, uh, that's always tragic. Let me give you the vaccine update, a new piece of our COVID update. Um, we've got about 36,000 doses administered. That means we have a lot of doses to administer this week, which have already arrived. Um, 76 locations are now administering the vaccine, the healthcare workers. 72 nursing home clinics have been completed. We ought to have two-thirds of all of our nursing home uh, completed with the first uh, dose by the end of this week, and all of our nursing homes with the first dose by the end of January. Um, we feel pretty good about that. Those are uh, good numbers in terms of getting the vaccine out there. I can tell you the residents are all lining up and ready to uh, get the vaccine. They know how important it is especially given uh, the demographics. Um, I continue to urge uh, the nurses and the work folks who are working at the um, nursing homes, um, there's some hesitancy there. Get the vaccine. It's free of charge. No questions asked. Maybe a few of you say, I already got COVID uh, before. I, I don't have to worry about it. I've got antibodies. Get the vaccine. It's much safer for you, much safer for your family, and much safer for all the residents that you're taking care of. Uh, and we've got our allocation committee following the CDC, Center for Disease Control, in terms of more formal guidance on 1B. That's the group of uh, first responders, um, first line, front line responders that follow the health care in the nursing homes, which is in the first category, which ought to be uh, pretty much done by the end of January. So we're coming up on that. All right, now, on the subject of better late than never, uh, the president um, yesterday signed the bipartisan uh, relief bill, and uh, what does that mean for Connecticut? It's been a long time coming. Uh, the first group of numbers here are preliminary numbers. Uh, we've gone through some of them before. These are things that you automatically will start receiving um, at least we don't have to apply it to the federal government for them. Starting with a $695 million unemployment assistance, that's going to start either this week or next week. Uh, Kurt Westby is waiting to hear guidance from the Federal Department of uh, Labor on that very soon. That will run through mid-March um, with the $300 federal true-up, so about $600 plus in unemployment for those uh, three months plus. Uh, next are the direct payments, which were the subject of some discussion, you maybe remember. That's $600 uh, per person, um, per adult, uh, earning less than $75,000 a year, and $600 for each child. And I believe those payments are going to go out uh, within the next week or so. So those should be pretty prompt, a big help um, in terms of some basic needs. Uh, the rental assistance, um, $237 million. We have not yet gotten the guidance from um, housing down in Washington in terms of how that will be done. As you know, our own Department of Housing and SELA have done about 5,500 um, rent relief negotiated between either landlords and tenants together, allowing people to stay in their homes, stay in their apartments a lot longer. No eviction through February 9th. Hopefully, we're able to negotiate longer than that. And the 200, we're, so we have plenty of money right now to continue negotiating that. So get in the queue. And then with this federal support, we'd like to think we'll be able to take care of thousands of additional. So we're doing everything we can to make sure you can stay in your home, in your apartment, and landlords have a, a payment schedule that gives them confidence uh, that they can pay their bills. Education. Um, 
let's face it, I think the feds were pretty generous when it came to education. $745 million for uh, the state of Connecticut. That's broken down about two to one, about $492 million for K through 12 education, mainly COVID-related expenses. We're getting the details on that, but that can be anything from everything we need to keep you safe to, uh, you know, apprentice teachers and others who can support and help. We've already done a lot on technology, as you know. And finally, $225 million for colleges and universities. Uh, most of that will be directly sent. In colleges and universities, that's for public as well as private colleges. And for K through 12, most of that is for the public schools, but some of that is allocated as well for parochial and independent schools. 312 million we'll be getting for a vaccine testing and tracing. Um, uh, you say, what? that's a lot of money, especially since the vaccines are already being provided by the feds testing. We've done about $250 million worth of testing to date already. We test more than just about any state in the country. Uh, we do that so we can get ahead of the curve um, and make sure that we can um, quarantine and track and trace people and reduce the nature of the curve. And so far, we've had some success there. Um, child care, uh, $67 million. Uh, uh, Beth Bai is working right now with her fellow, um, you know, child care advocates around the region, seeing whether those will be for subsidies or direct payments to our child care providers. An enormous help. $210 million for urban transit, buses and the such. They've got a lot lower ridership. This will make up for a lot of that shortfall and make sure the buses can continue to take uh, essential workers to work. Uh, highways, um, that's uh, going to be, uh, you know, granted through DOT. Airport improvement, we're getting the information on that. I asked about this, $41 million for FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, funeral benefits. Um, uh, sadly, with a lot of fatalities in this state and around the country, and uh, a fair number of folks can't afford, um, you know, a, a decent uh, uh, funeral. So, They've set aside $41 million for the state of Connecticut. We're figuring out who to, how to work with the funeral homes, churches, hospitals, to make sure you know how to apply for this. And it's a grant that will be available to you as needed. <clears throat> the next chart uh, is additional relief available. And here I really need Glenlin's help. But it's just worth noting that most of this you have to apply for, and we can help you apply for it. As you know, um, uh, Glenn and David and the DECD group did a really good job of providing um, bridge support for you. Uh, we've got the $50 million in the, to the smallest uh, companies, another $35 million, which we're getting out now. We did very well as a state for the Paycheck Protection Program loans last time, but I want you to uh, listen to Glendale in terms of how you, again, we, Connecticut, and our small business can get to the front of the line working with your um, financial advisors to make sure this is um, money that we get back to you to help you power through the final, what I hope are the final few months of um, this pandemic until our economy gets going again. Uh, additional money that we'll help you apply for is uh, for live uh, venues, theaters, museums, um, SNAP benefits for food support, uh, community development financial institutions. That's a new program of getting information, but if we get our 1% of that, that is, um, you know, $30 million to go to uh, neighborhood associations and start up for financial support there. Same with capital investments in um, those disadvantaged neighborhoods, um, black and brown, urban as well as rural, where we can provide you some of the capital investment you need to help you get back on your feet. You can read the rest of these, I think, yourselves, uh, but I really would like to um, get Glendon to talk a little bit more about how we can help you get to the front of the line in terms of what we're doing with our state aid, which is a bridge to the federal support, and a little description of how else we can be supportive. Glendon, welcome. Thank you, Governor. Um, as everyone knows, our small businesses are the heart and soul of our local and state economy. And from the onset of the pandemic, DECD has been doing everything we can to keep our small businesses uh, sustained and our economy going. 
with the limited resources that we've had, we've really tried to prioritize that access to capital for businesses. So again, they can sustain their or their operations in these um, unprecedented economic downturn. And so today, I just want to update everyone on uh, two of the uh, main state programs that we have actively going now for small businesses, and then also sharing good news relative to the federal government um, and uh, direct relief that is coming for small businesses and nonprofits, as the governor mentioned. So first and foremost, uh, the DECD $50 million Connecticut CARES grant program that launched uh, at the end of October, uh, that program was targeted to our smallest of small businesses. The application is closed. We received over 18,000 applications. Uh, our goal is to fund up to 10,000 businesses in the next uh, week um, for a one-time grant of $5,000. Uh, to date, close to 6,000 businesses and nonprofits have been notified and approved. And so we're working with our, our technology partner, SoFi, and getting those companies funded over the next several days. We continue to do further due diligence on the remaining eligible small businesses to get us to that 10,000 um, number, if you will. And so again, I just uh, encourage everyone to look out for their emails, check their spam, um, because we continue to communicate with business and for those, unfortunately, that were not able to um, pass our eligibility test and get funded, we have communicated and will continue to communicate with those businesses over the next several days and also encourage them to get ready for additional resources that are coming down from the federal government. Next up is the $35 million uh, business recovery program that we launched uh, over a week ago. Um, and this program is really targeted to our hardest hit industries. Um, no, no application is required. We're estimating that the final eligibility pool would be about 2,000 businesses. Um, we're heavily focused on accommodations, retail, um, and other hardest hit industries. The grant sizes will range from 10,000 to 30,000. Um, average size probably will be about $15,000, um, but that depends on a, a number of criteria. We are in the process of finalizing that eligibility criteria. We will be posting it on the DECD website later this week, so please stay posted. Um, businesses who are eligible will be notified uh, by DRS through their secured portal. So if you have an account set up with DRS, you will be getting a notification um, sometime this week notifying you on the grant that is coming in the mail. Our goal is to have checks uh, sent directly to the address of that business that is on file with DRS later this week. So. Uh, individual businesses who are eligible should be receiving checks in the first week of January. Um, again, look out for the final eligibility criteria that will be posted on the website and just continue to monitor your, in, your inbox um, and your mail for, for that check. We know that the state programs that we've you know, designed to date have not been enough and will unlikely cover all the expenses and losses um, and economic harm that our small businesses have faced uh, through this uh, process. But we know that now we have the long anticipated federal stimulus bill um, that was approved last night. And so that is really good news. The president signed the $900 billion stimulus package um, to provide economic relief to our communities, individuals, and businesses. Of that $900 billion, $325 billion has been dedicated to small businesses, including $284 million for another round of the Paycheck Protection Program and $20 billion for the Economic Disaster Injury Loan Program administered through the SBA. So with that, uh, two of the significant uh, things that I think companies should be looking for with this new round is that, again, for those who did not get uh, a bite at the apple in the first round in the earlier year, they now get another opportunity to apply. Second, this bill enables a second draw. So if you are a business uh, that uh, has no more than 300 employees and, have, and has experienced a revenue loss, um, in any quarter of 2020, you're able to get another secure, forgivable PPP loan. 
Um, the program is still going to be administered through the U.S. Department of Small Business Administration, um, and the, S the PPP loans will be secured by the SBA-approved bank. So you still need to work with your bank or credit union or the many online fintech lenders who are partnering with the SBA on this program. As the governor mentioned, to date, over $7 billion um, dollars, uh, the state of Connecticut and our small businesses received through the first and second rounds of PPP and IDLE, and we've punched well above our weight on a pay per capita basis. And so we're well positioned to make sure our businesses get their fair share of this upcoming round. And so uh, a few call to actions for businesses. So if you are a small business, I would recommend you do the following. Contact your current bank. Uh, to determine if they will be participating in the next round. Um, visit the SBA website to get a listing of SBA approved lenders, the credit unions and the online uh, FinTech lenders at www.sba.gov and get connected to one of our partners. So we have the Connecticut Small Business Development Center, the Connecticut Women's Business Development Center, the Black Business Alliance, Alliance uh, the Spanish American Merchants Association, who are all on standby, ready to help you. We'll be doing webinars uh, over the next several days to get you positioned and well-prepared to get ready for when the program uh, goes live. Last but not least, please continue to visit business.ct.gov for upcoming and uh, updated information on reopening and recovery resources, and then our DECD hotline at 860-500-2333, 860-500-2333. We're still downloading a lot of the information relative to uh, this new stimulus bill, but we are going to continue to partner with our, our partners, you, and get you all the information you need to make sure, again, our companies get our fair share. So thank you. Thanks, Glenn. That was uh, really helpful and on short notice since this thing just got signed. All right, Max. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, Governor, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be very happy to hear about this relief, but do we know, you know, when this is actually going to hit their accounts? Is there even a rough timeline for when some of this money will get to the people? Yeah, I think the uh, direct payments um, are going to be uh, sent as early as this week. So you ought to get them, say, within a week or so. That's the $600 per. I think the PPP will probably take a little bit longer. Uh, that's why we've got these uh, interim um, loan programs or grant programs in place that Glenn just described. Unemployment um, is going to be next week or soon thereafter, depending on guidance we're waiting to hear from labor right now. It's going to work pretty quickly, not as quickly as we need. And Ms. Thames, you know, speaking about the business recovery program, you know, with there being no application process, uh, can you kind of describe what some of the qualifications would be to be able to get this grant? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Sorry, something was going on with my um, internet connection. Uh, so we are using a variety of, of eligibility criteria to determine the final eligibility pool. We're focused on NAICS codes that of industries that have been hardest hit, wages and gross receipts. Um, also, the average gross receipts for businesses receiving this grant um, have, you know, they can demonstrate that they've been down 25% uh, year over year, if you will. So those are a few of the criteria that we are uh, looking at as we finalize the pool. Um, but again, we hope to uh, uh, post these uh, the final criteria um, on our website uh, later this week. Right, and my last one, and I think this is probably uh, for Josh, uh, this is about the vaccine rollout. You know, we have 36,000 doses administered. Is this what the state was hoping for, or did we kind of fall short uh, of our goals for the vaccination? Like, is the confidence there? No, we're off to a great start. Um, you know, we are, uh, there, one thing to point out is there's there's a bit of a time lag with some of the reporting, particularly with CVS and Walgreens under their federal contract with Operation Warp Speed. They have three days to report. So the data will always lag a little bit. But, you know, our hospitals have been have been doing a fantastic job of getting uh, folks vaccinated. The nursing home uh, really started to ramp up last week. Um, 
and we got deliveries out to over 40 federally qualified health centers and local health departments kind of middle of last week. So those will really ramp up this week. Um, but we had two days last week, Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Wednesday last week, where we did over 7,000 vaccinations on a single day. So that's, you know, above the run rate that we need to be at for the 57,000 or so per week that we've been told to expect going forward right now from the federal government. So I think overall the state's done a fantastic job ramping up. Per capita, we're over 40 percent more vaccinations already completed than, than New York State, as an example. From the states I've seen publishing, we're, we're doing extremely well. So off to a great start. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a great holiday. Uh, wanted to ask regarding the latest stimulus bill. Is this seen as enough? Do you feel like there's going to need to be another round? And then in terms of this one, how is it helping the state overall regarding budget? Well, it's less of a budget item right now. These are uh, monies um, for COVID-related expenses, not to replace uh, budget holes. But look, it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference for our uh, towns and local schools. It gives our universities some certainty going forward. Look, they got hit. Our universities got hit, or, as you know, um, you know, residents' life and dining, where they um, get some of their revenues were decimated. This is going to be um, a big plus for their budget going forward. Look, I'd like to see uh, going forward a continued aid for small business, depending on what we see. Um, uh, with COVID over the next few months, um, some state and local aid that would help out, uh, you know, towns and municipalities that had their revenues hit, as well as the state would be much appreciated. But um, I'll tell you, this is coming in at the nick of time right now for what we got. And also hoping to have you expand on the vaccine hesitancy you mentioned. Like, what are you seeing from those who can get it right now? And also, is there any indication of the percentage of the general public um, that will that can get the vaccine if that has increased? I'll tell you anecdotally, I think um, in the general population, people are feeling more confident about taking the vaccine every week. They see people on TV, they've heard from friends, they see uh, the, no reactions, they see it as uh, safe and uh, time will tell, but they believe it effective. But Josh, do you have anything more specific than that? No, that, that's right, Governor. Um, you know, it's it's uh, we're hearing anecdotally um, a little bit of hesitancy out there, particularly, um, you know, amongst nursing home staff to some degree. But look, uh, a lot of this is education and, and we are continuing to work with our partners in the, in the industry, our partners in labor, um, you know, and others around the community to uh, help ensure everyone has all the information because the information, fortunately, is very clear that the vaccine is incredibly effective, very safe. And I think, as the governor said, the more people uh, they see, friends, coworkers, uh, prominent community leaders getting vaccinated, the more that'll help. And then my last question, the COVID numbers you mentioned are looking pretty stable right now. How likely is it that it would increase in the next few weeks due to the holidays? Is there any early on indication of that? I think there will be some increase. Uh, I think we saw a lot of air traffic back and forth, more importantly, people driving around. That all uh, seems to stir the pot. Uh, I mentioned that we've seen some of our neighboring states see a slight uptick, not a surge, but an uptick. So, um, yeah, we're being cautious. Thank you. News 8. Governor, when you look at the big picture, from the vaccines rolling out, from the aid and the money rolling out of Washington, D.C., to businesses and to people's pockets, but also the spike, big picture, how do you see the health of Connecticut moving forward? Are, are we close are we is it a fine balance how would you describe it look i think it's a fine balance uh, there's no question about that but look we had um tens of thousands of people who are about to lose their uh, unemployment insurance uh, today so um that's not going to happen um because uh, at the last moment we got uh, the agreement signed by the president so a, a little bit of economic certainty takes a lot of stress off of uh, families and uh, small business and uh, gives me a little bit of breathing room as well, to tell you the truth. Uh, COVID, look, I'm very thankful. We had a flare-up after Thanksgiving. We um, issued the warnings, uh, perhaps uh, ad nauseum, but it was really important. And um, so far, you know, we've had this vacation time for about five, six, seven days now, and our numbers are stable. Uh, they're going to probably go up a little bit. I appreciate that, but I feel 
more confident that they're not going up like a hockey stick. So um, let's hang in there a little bit longer together. All right, and then you had a news release uh, about a staff member that tested positive on your staff. How are they doing? And can you give a little just description of what they did, or I, I don't know without naming names, but the risk factor there? Hey, Paul, you want to take that? Yeah, I will, Governor. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, we had a, a staff member that we announced, uh, that I announced uh, earlier today, that tested uh, positive uh, for the coronavirus over the weekend. Uh, we have put strict protocols into our office uh, for quite a few months um, in terms of spacing in the office, making sure people are not around each other for uh, long periods of time, that there's masks, there's appropriate PPE in the office, um, hand sanitizer and such. Uh, uh, it's safe to say uh, this time around that uh, we have uh, no, no individual in our office that will be quarantining uh, based upon uh, this most recent case. Um, the individual uh, is, was experiencing symptoms. Uh, they're doing better now. Um, and uh, we uh, look forward to their full recovery, full, co full recovery over the coming days uh, and weeks. Good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, most of the folks in our office are telecommuting, as you can imagine. And um, Paul's got the office right next to mine, and we communicate by Zoom. How you doing, Paul? <laughs> Fox sixty one. Hey, Governor, it's Matt here, and I hope you had a merry Christmas. You um, too, Matt. I just. I just wanted to ask you, everyone's talking about this new strain of COVID, uh, which seems to be more contagious. Uh, luckily, no indications that it would compromise a vaccine. Uh, but it might just be a matter of time before we see it crop up here in the United States. So I'm wondering what your level of concern is. If it is discovered here, uh, would your strategy change at all? And if you'd like to weigh in on if you think the United States should be taking a harder line on traveler restrictions. I think we're taking a pretty hard line on travel restrictions, and I think it's appropriate, uh, especially people coming from Britain, and now it's spreading to other um, you know, countries in Europe. I think it uh, makes an awful lot of sense. They got to get tested, and they got to quarantine, and uh, better yet, stay home. Um, that said, we can't put up a wall, and uh, this uh, strain is probably going to come to the United States. It's probably here right now. It's probably here in Connecticut right now. Uh, what little I can tell you as a um, history major is uh, I know the vaccine works on it, and I know if you wear the mask and, uh, you know, keep your distance, uh, we can contain this more um, infectious uh, strain as well. Look, uh, flus often morph uh, over the period of time. We've got to make sure that we have a vaccine that works, and this one continues to work even with this new strain. All right, and given that new strain and the infectivity rate of it, um, and the infection rate that we're currently seeing. Wondering if now, if you think now is the right time to move to remote learning. You, I'm sure you saw the, uh, the teachers unions coming out with the survey, 57% saying they don't feel safe in the classroom and even more than that wanting to shift online after break. Yeah. Um, well, look, we're gonna watch this very carefully, uh, emphasizing public health. Um, so you know, kids are more likely to get infected when they're not in the classroom, uh, you know, uh, when they're outside, friends, neighbors, whatever it might be. So I take that to heart. Uh, you know, maybe we'll find, well, it's up to our local superintendents, of course, maybe they'll say we want to um, go remote for that first week just to see um, what happens in the post-vacation period. But I think uh, at the end of the day, I'd like to see our kids get back to school unless some something changes very dramatically in the metrics. All right, one more for you, if I could. Uh, I've been reading about how the vaccine vials uh, may contain, in some cases, an extra dose, um, which I'm sure is a welcome surprise. And I'm, I'm wondering if you've been hearing that same thing from healthcare professionals and if that will help accelerate how fast we get through the line and to another phase. Yeah, as you remember, we were shortchanged a little bit by Pfizer going back a week or so ago. But the good news is these are multi-dose vials and instead of having five doses, they had six or even seven in some cases. And we allocated them uh, carefully with an eyedropper. And uh, so that increased our supply a bit. I think they probably got it better now, don't they, in terms of the allocation, Josh? No, yeah, I think that's exactly right. The, the Pfizer vials are 
uh, advertised as five doses. You know, most uh, of them have been delivering uh, six doses. The Moderna vials are uh, set for 10 doses, and in many cases, uh, uh, vaccinators have been getting 11 doses out of those vials. So um, that's been signed off by the, the FDA, our local health department. So that's good news, um, and the teams will continue to use every bit of supply we have to uh, help get through the population as quickly as possible. Thanks, guys. WTIC 1080 News. Hi. O overall, in the first round of PPP loans, it turned out that many millions went to companies that didn't need the cash, laid people off anyway, or were politically connected. What are the safeguards in place this time to get the cash to real deal small business that, frankly, need a lifeline to, to stay alive? Glenn, how are we emphasizing smaller businesses this time? Yeah, so in, the, um, in this latest version, one of the um, specific criteria that they put in place for this kind of second draw program is that a business doesn't have any more than 300 uh, employees and has experienced revenue losses in any quarter for 2020, um, if you will. They're able to then access that second draw. Additionally, they have uh, set-asides for uh, small kind of community lenders and community financial development institutions to make sure they can get more market penetration into those hardest hit and underserved uh, communities. So I think, again, they're still kind of downloading this information and putting together the program guidelines and details, but I think from the federal delegation um, and members of Congress, they were very conscious about, again, not benefiting the more sophisticated, bigger companies and really focusing on those that are hardest hit in our main street businesses, if you will. And Governor, how do you think the state did as far as Christmas travel and should we be bracing for a difficult January? It looked like from observ observationally that um, the, the, the not necessarily here, but the airports were packed across the country. I think that's right. Not necessarily Bradley Airport, but certainly, um, you know, Kennedy, LaGuardia, uh, Newark. Uh, I think there was a lot more traffic this time than there was, say, at Thanksgiving. And um, we'll just have to wait and see, I think, won't we? I hope the people are coming in from out of state or out of town. Uh, they... Um, get tested and follow the uh, quarantine rules because uh, that's how they'll keep our community safe and their families safe. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, does the state plan to again provide people on unemployment who are earning less than the $100 a week the extra money to even it out so they qualify for this extra federal $300? Yes, so I think we should do that. Where would the money come from? Uh, right now, my understanding is it comes from the, um, the unemployment um, trust fund that we have, where we get virtually zero interest loans from the federal government. These are a lot of folks who are earning just a little bit less than 100, so they were frozen out of the unemployment benefits, and they're really in need. So you definitely are going to do that then? Yes. Okay. And, and sorry to keep um, <laughs> I'm jumping on it, but do you know when by chance? I think I better get back to you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Department of Labor is watching me as we speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and um, maybe this is for uh, Gwendolyn. Um, would you have preferred to have seen the federal government include uh, grants in the federal program instead of uh, more loans? Because we hear this all the time that a lot of these businesses, they just don't want to take on more debt. Yeah, I mean, in this environment, grants are, are definitely what our businesses um, need. And that's why, you know, through our Connecticut CARES grant program, um, as well as the Connecticut Business Recovery Program we launched uh, over a week ago, we were focused on those grants because we understand the anxiety that our small businesses are having on taking on more debt. And they literally can't take on more debt. So I want to let everybody know that we're listening. Um, and with this new round with PPP, they are forgivable, right? And I think there was a lot of confusion with the first and second round, 
on you know what those forgivable features were and the the details and there was a lot of back and forth on kind of you know misinformation if you will and so i think um through this next round they've really cleaned up a lot of that language and our partners such as the women's business development center um and the connecticut business development center that i mentioned earlier have been doing a lot of education over the last several months on that forgivable uh, loan piece so again businesses understand what that means and what they need to do to get that forgiveness because ultimately it turns into a grant. But a lot of people just didn't understand that. So there's just a lot of education that has gone onto this and I think people have a better grasp of what they're signing on to. Hey, Sue. Okay, thank you very Yes. Just yes. as a reminder, um, for those folks earning less than $100, we help them get up to the $100 mark so they're eligible for significant federal support. But it's a seven, six to one federal support for those people. Right. You, I know you did that the last go round, and I know you were talking about wanting to do it this time around. Exactly. Okay. All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Governor, um, you said the timing of this is going to save a lot of people from the loss of unemployment benefits. But at this hour, are you confident that the governor's delay, I mean, sorry, the president's delay in signing the bill. Are you confident that that is not going to cause uh, the loss of a week's benefits or an interruption in benefits? I'm confident of nothing down there, but I do know that uh, Kurt Westby, our commissioner, is on the phone as we speak with the Federal Department of Labor, getting the guidance to see whether those um, that unemployment can start this week and not on January 3rd. And uh, we'll let you know as soon as we hear. Last week, uh, Governor, you said that the president's behavior was erratic and dangerous. Uh, what is your assessment today as to the president really letting America kind of twist in the wind for a week over whether or not this relief was going to go out the door? I just thought it was unnecessary, a bit of grandstanding, and uh, put a lot of people on edge during a very a desperate time. And uh, But all's well that ends well, and I'm glad we got it solved. The rule of thumb that uh, the senators have been using is that Connecticut gets basically 1%. So they've been using a $9 billion number. Um, I know you had a, a couple of ways of presenting it earlier, direct and indirect. But is that also the rough assumption your administration has, is that roughly $9 billion of this package will be flowing to Connecticut? Uh, I don't think there's a direct correlation. Uh, Dan DeSimone um, works me, for example, that probably we don't have as many um, theatrical and event venues as perhaps New York City does, so they, maybe they would get a little higher percentage of uh, that particular piece of the pie than we do. But overall, when it comes to unemployment, when it comes to PPP, the big, you know, dollar amounts, um, you know, we're going to be getting a significant share of that. Absolutely. Most of that is automatic. Yeah. And I'll also add as well, and you saw this from the PPP rounds, we're going to be extremely aggressive in making sure people and entities that are eligible for the various competitive uh, related funding know about it and have all the information to be able to apply for it. Every dollar into Connecticut is beneficial for Connecticut, and we're going to fight hard for every single one of those dollars. Thank you. Hearst Connecticut Media. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. Um, so just to start, it was mentioned at a previous press conference that um, assisted living facilities are going to start receiving the vaccine um, kind of a little bit later than nursing homes. And I was just wondering if you could um, give some clarity as to to why they're not included in the same week as nursing homes. Is, is that process the same as the CDS and Walgreens clinics? Well, I'll start. I mean, we're going to have all the nursing homes done uh, by uh, that first week in January. And I think um, those other um, centers will be soon to follow. But Josh? Yeah, that, that's right, Governor. Um, so under the, the federal um, contract with CVS and Walgreens, they broke the long-term care facilities into different tiers. Um, and we prioritize nursing homes to go first. That's the category of facilities where we've obviously seen the most severe illness and death through this pandemic. So we wanted to make sure all resources were 
uh, trained on those facilities first, um, and we've activated the second tier already, which will begin as soon as next week, and that includes assisted living facilities and residential care homes, um, where those same teams of vaccinators will then be going out to those facilities. So that'll happen um, as soon as next week. That, that part of the program will ramp up as well. Thanks. Um, and then by the numbers, uh, the CDC's data is showing Connecticut is trending a little bit lower um, than surrounding states on cases per capita over seven days. Uh, are we just testing less or, or do you think these numbers show we're actually starting to bend the second curve? What's your, what's your take on that? What do you think, Josh? No, we're, we're not testing less. We test at very similar levels to um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire on any, or Massachusetts, um, Rhode Island and New York. On any given day, we're, we're kind of right around each other. Um, so it's not a function of the volume of testing. Um, as the governor mentioned earlier, our, our test positivity rate, though, has been um, uh, trending downwards while theirs has been trending upwards. Um, and so um, that's not something we should take for granted. Um, we still have you know, a lot of, a lot of community spread in Connecticut as well. And we still have about 170 people a day um, checking into our hospitals with severe COVID. Um, so, you know, as the governor's mentioned, you know, as we come to the holiday period, we have to be very, very careful here to try to avoid um, that risk, including now looking at some of our neighboring states posting up some pretty large uh, positivity rates today uh, coming out of the, the long weekend. The day of New London. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My first question is for Glendalyn. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about just the, the process for the state, you know, doing these these new business, the two business programs you mentioned. I know that with the end of the year approaching, it seems like a lot is happening at once between the federal relief package and the two programs you mentioned. So how does DECD kind of go about deciding, you know, when to do these different rounds of funding for, for programming for businesses, how much to give um, and, and where that money comes from? Thank you for the question. So since the onset of this pandemic, we've really been, you know, pacing ourselves and doing business impact surveys to inform, you know, what the economic harm and loss is that then informs our policies and investments. So early on in the pandemic, we stood up the Connecticut Recovery Bridge loan product and also the revolving uh, loan for minority owned and women owned businesses with the forgivable grant. Um, and then by that time, the federal government came out with, you know, billions of dollars in PPP and IDLE. And so many of our businesses were able to access that. And we got close to $8 billion injected in our, into our economy, you know, within a matter of months. Um, and then that money dried up, right? And so we knew that our businesses were going months in and months out without any additional federal help mm -hmm while also experiencing revenue losses because of the pandemic and uh, restrictions on their businesses and some businesses legitimately not even able to open, right? And so then that informed, again, the need for grants and to be able to prioritize some of our federal Connecticut CARES grant dollars towards our small businesses. And through the partnership with uh, the governor and his leadership, we decided to, again, launch these two grant programs to be that bridge and that shot in the arm, recognizing that there was additional federal dollars that were coming. Um, because again, they can print money. They, have, they can backstop majority of this where Connecticut, we can't. We need our federal government, but we can do what we can um, with the limited resources that we have. And then I also had a question on the, the vaccine distribution, uh, probably one for Josh. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the process for kind of determining the number of doses that different facilities get, whether it's, you know, a health center, a health district, long-term care facility, and then kind of piggybacking off the question about number of, of doses in a vial, you know, what, what happens if they have quote unquote more than they've asked for for number of people or, or are you seeing situations there where, you know, people who maybe aren't necessarily supposed to be included in, in phase 1A are, are getting vaccinated just because their facility has the number of, of doses for one reason or another? Sure. Um, so a lot, a lot there, Erica, but good questions. Um, so briefly, um, for the, the long-term care program through CVS and Walgreens, um, the federal government has set um, uh, uh, 
uh, guidelines for how many doses we have to set aside when we activate those tiers that I mentioned in, in our answer to a prior question. So we have to set aside those doses. CVS and Walgreens have very um, rigorous protocols to make sure that no uh, doses kind of go to waste, right? So they bring only what they think they need. Um, they keep the doses, um, you know, refrigerated as necessary so that if they need to bring them to a clinic the next day, they can do that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there's very, the teams are doing a very good job from what we can tell of making sure all the, the um, the doses get uh, into targeted 1A populations. And then with regards to, you know, our, our other healthcare providers, our hospitals, our federally qualified health centers, our local health departments, um, there's an active dialogue that goes on between them and our State Department of Public Health, understanding their capacity, how many vaccinators they have, what refrigeration capacity they have, what populations they're going to be serving. And we're working with them in a very iterative process to make sure that, that they're getting the orders and the deliveries a vaccine um, that is kind of maxing out their capacity, um, not letting vials gather dust in a refrigerator during a week, um, but also uh, not giving them more than they can handle. So um, a very good process set up uh, compliments to our team at Department of Public Health and all of our provider uh, partners who are you know, doing a great job standing this up from scratch. And then uh, one more question for the governor, you know, with uh, 2021 approaching, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about, you know, what Connecticut residents and, and business owners can expect from the upcoming legislative session and what your uh, top priorities and goals are for next year. Yeah, we've got to, Erica, we got to get through this COVID uh, first and foremost. That's key to our economic health as well as our, um, our greater public health. I look forward to working closely with the legislature on that. You know, we've got 80-plus um, executive orders. I think the legislature is going to want to take a look at some of those, decide where we are in terms of the infection rate sometime in January, figure out whether they want to give us, give me a little more executive authority to help us power through um, COVID a little bit longer. I think that will be probably a priority, uh, you know, number one and two as we uh, sit down. You know, from there, if we get everybody back in the building by um, – February or March, we'll figure out uh, how big an agenda we feel like we can do. If we're still more distant, we may be a bit, be a bit more cautious. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. Good afternoon. Is there an estimate of how many doses will be distributed or given out uh, by Friday of this week? Uh, I, I don't think we're going to get into the business of forecasting by day uh, the number of doses we're going to be administering. But, um, you know, we're, the teams are, are ramping up, as I mentioned, and, you know, we're going to be uh, I'm very confident we're going to be administrating doses as quickly as they come into the state within, within that week. And I know there's a plan for the next phase hasn't been formally released, but a lot of grandparents are asking, you know, or, or anyone over 75, um, when it is their turn, what is the plan? Do you, can you paint a small picture of what they can expect? Are they going to go to the pharmacy and get their shot there? Sure. So there, there's a, a system that's been set up. Um, so as we approach phase 1B as an example, certain categories of uh, frontline essential workers will be eligible, um, as well as people above uh, 75 years old and, and potentially some other populations that our allocation committee is looking at right now. But essentially what will happen is people who are eligible will be loaded into this system and then they can log in and um, search based on their zip code uh, to see what vaccination clinics are available near them or convenient to them, what time slots are available, book a time slot, um, ensure that they have all the right documentation when they go, et cetera. So it'll, it'll be a, you know, a process similar to what I just described for, for folks as they're uh, as their population uh, becomes eligible. So um, sit tight for now. There'll be a lot more guidance coming about this as we approach phase 1B, but that's still uh, a few weeks away. The Hartford Current. Hi, I just had a question um, about the staffer who tested positive, wondering if you would mind identifying their position or type of work. Um, I will just say that it's an individual who works in our office as a member of our team. Um, and Governor, why are you not self-quarantining this time around um, when you've done so in the past? Uh, just because we're keeping real distance, uh, myself and all the staff, including this person who I was not in close contact with uh, at all over the last couple of weeks. So um, feel, felt like it was not necessary this time. 
Okay, thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Um, Josh, I think you kind of touched on this just a second ago, but um, we've been getting a lot of reader questions from, from folks who think, who say, uh, you know, here's my job, here's my situation, here's my age, and they don't know when they fall in the, um, in the phases. So, and I, I guess I'm looking to know what, what should we tell them as the authority to go to to say when they can expect to be eligible? Sure. Well, as, as, all, as with all things uh, COVID-19, I'd recommend they go to our ct.gov slash coronavirus uh, website. There is a new section that's been set up there with uh, specifically focused on our vaccination program. Um, although, as I just mentioned, um, you know, there, there's not as much detail as probably a lot of people will be looking for yet around phase 1B, phase 1C, and so forth, because those details are still being filled in. Our vaccine advisory group, the allocation committee, is meeting this week. They'll be meeting again next week. We hope to have recommendations uh, from that group to the governor uh, as soon as next week, at which point um, you know, we'll begin to continue to offer more information both on specifics of who's in scope for phase 1B and then the logistics around how those people can go about setting up their appointment to get vaccinated and when. Okay, and um, is the status of, of when uh, prison inmates will be vac vaccinated. Is that still sort of up in the air from one of those advisory committees? Right. That's that's one of the very important issues that uh, questions that that vaccine advisory group is looking at right now. Okay. Thanks, uh, Governor. Did you? Uh, I apologize. I didn't quite hear what you said. Did you said you will be seeking um, to renew the executive authority come February? I think uh, I'm going to be discussing that with the legislative leaders, and I think a lot of that will depend on where we are in the COVID infection rate uh, a month from now. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. I'm getting the signal. Um, hey, Glendalyn, thank you for joining us. Um, you got a short Christmas break, and you're going to be very busy. Um, but I think progress is not a straight line. It can go up. It can be shallow. It can be fast. It can be slow. But I do think we're making progress. I think we're making progress on the economic front and, more importantly, on the public health front. Uh, let's hang in there a little longer. Thanks, everybody.